So my name is Kara Brancoli, and I'm the Senior Reference Librarian here at the Mill Valley Public Library. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight, and a uh, big thank you to the Mill Valley Library Foundation and the Friends for the, their generous support of our After Hours series and many of the other programs here at the library. Um, also, a very special thank you to the Smart Family Foundation for funding um, to explore educational issues, which this is um, our keynote uh, speech for that um, series. So uh, this is a wonderful turnout. And uh, I have to admit, we were a bit worried about drawing a crowd on a cold, wet, uh, evening during the peak holiday season to learn about the current state of ADHD. Yet, uh, here we are with uh, close to 250 people. Yeah. <laughs> and so clearly ADHD as a subject resonates with many people in our community. You may be here because ADHD touches you and your family personally. Uh, and, or maybe you work in a related field or perhaps you may not have a personal connection to the disorder, but are part of the growing number of people who want to better understand the explosion of ADHD, which we read about on a regular basis. Well, we are extremely fortunate tonight to welcome one of the leading researchers on the subject. Uh, Dr. Stephen Henshaw is professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. He is also the vice chair of psychology and professor of psychiatry at UCSF. His work has been written about widely, and he's been quoted in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, among other newspapers. Dr. Hinshaw received his BA from Harvard, summa cum laude, and his doctorate in clinical psychology from UCLA. His work focuses on developmental psychopathology, clinical interventions, and mental, mental illness stigma, with a major focus on ADHD. Dr. Henshaw has authored numerous articles and books, including The Triple Bind, Saving Our Teenage Girls from Today's Pressures, and most recently, The ADHD Explosion, Myths, Medication, Money, and Today's Push for Performance. He has been one of the most productive scholars in the field of clinical psychology across the past decade. Uh, Dr. Henshaw's books will be on sale uh, after his talk, so I invite you to, to purchase one of his, his books. Um, so without further ado, it is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Stephen Hinshaw. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the sound worked before. I think it's working now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about controversies, because ADHD is a very controversial topic, some of the myths, try to get into some facts and some of the science and clinical realities, and that's a little better. It's not quite so glary on the screen. And we'll be talking it about what's called a multiple levels of analysis approach. We'll be talking about genes and heritability and kids and families and schools all the way to state and federal policy. Because unless you have an understanding of all of those levels, I think you missed a complete picture. So Kara just nicely mentioned the ADHD explosion that came out last year. And just coming out six weeks ago is the latest in Oxford Press's What Everyone Needs to Know series. They did a little book a year and a half ago called Cuba, What Everyone Needs to Know, and it did well with the political changes. And so Kathy Ellison, a fellow resident of Marin with all of you, and I wrote uh, ADHD, What Everyone Needs to Know, which is Oxford's first uh, entree in, the, uh, in mental health with this What Everyone Needs to Know series. It's a question and answer format. It's very scientifically credible, but there's no references or footnotes. It's, uh, meant to be digestible, and authors discount $10 sitting over behind the wine. ADHD is in the news a lot, and as we'll talk about shortly, if you thought it was diagnosed a lot a decade ago, it's diagnosed a lot more now. In fact, 41% more for kids since 2003. It's like an epidemic, but it's not an epidemic. It's not contagious. So is this real, or is it just being diagnosed more? And we'll have a lot to say about that. ADHD receives a lot of stigma and ridicule, and you have to look no further than the New York Times. Excellent articles by Nick Kristoff on post-traumatic stress disorder, serious mental illness, features on bipolar disorder, and the ADHD, the news stories aren't so bad, it's the op-eds and the Sunday review pieces 
that are full of ridicule. Medicating kids with ADHD gets everyone off the hook except the kids because it's poisoning them. David Brooks has joined in the act. Richard Friedman, uh, a very eminent writer and psychiatrist, has uh, bemoaned to the overuse of ADHD medications. They have to be used wisely, and they have to be used in combination. But I have a distinct feeling, though I don't know this, that some relative of some member of the Times board was diagnosed too quickly or had an adverse reaction, because you don't find that level of ridicule and stigma about other forms of mental illness in the Times these days. Now, what's really interesting about ADHD, this is similar for autism, is every couple of years you read the paper and we've discovered the new cause. And in 2011, we finally realized that the cause of ADHD is SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> so a little sidebar in the front. The research upon which this was based was done by our colleague at Virginia, the developmental psychologist, Angeline Lillard, who had randomly assigned four-year-olds to nine minutes of SpongeBob, nine minutes of a public television nature show, or nine minutes of free play, and then immediately given them tests of attention and executive functioning. And the kids who'd watched SpongeBob didn't pay very good attention during the test battery. Now, this is an important finding. Maybe fast-paced cartoons designed for older kids aren't very good temporarily for children's executive functions, but to think that this is the cause of ADHD, it's again part of the ridicule. Or it's all about lax parenting. We'll have a lot to say about parenting that clearly matters, but it's not the primary cause. ADHD is neurobiologically based enough that parents aren't to blame, maybe except for the genes they transmit, but they're certainly responsible for keeping the parenting show together, and it definitely matters for outcome. Or ADHD is just an excuse for fidgety kids. It's all about in unresponsive schools and a culture that doesn't appreciate differences in kids. We'll have a lot to say about that. How many people do you know who are working to get accommodations for their kids because of an ADHD or LD diagnosis? How many, not only college but high school students, are taking someone else's ADHD medicines? I gave a talk two falls ago to the combined PTAs for the three local high schools right here in Marin because the editors of the school papers had reported a survey they'd done, a confidential survey at the beginning of the school year. 10% of the ninth graders and 41% of the seniors admitted to using someone else's stimulants to help their performance. This is high performance stakes in high school, much less college. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe everybody should take stimulants. We'd be a smarter society. Or are there problems? Well, we'll have more to say about this. So we're going to introduce the talk tonight with a look at some advertisements that aren't just for doctors. They're for the general public. These are called DTC or direct-to-consumer ads. You couldn't look at these ads before 1997 or 9 because that's when the Food and Drug Administration made it much easier for companies in the United States to prepare ads directly to consumers. So I don't work for pharma, I don't consult. Why am I showing you these ads? I'm not trying to sell you pills. It's under the doctrine called fair use, where a scholar can examine advertisements, not with the intention of selling, but to point out what the messages might be. So here's our first ad that came out about 12 or 13 years ago from Concerta. So Concerta was the first really effective, if you will, long-lasting Ritalin or methylphenidates, the generic. The company down in the South Bay had worked for a long time to devise a device that would squirt it out slowly over 8, 10, or 12 hours. Don't, don't need to take it at lunch. Don't need to take it before soccer. So the ad is quite intriguing. Smiling mother, smiling child. I'm adding a few words in. When my son takes medication, I see my son, not those annoying, bothersome ADHD symptoms. I see, all the, I see the real kid there. It's a powerful message, whether it's true or not. I remember a company is advertising it this way. So one of the questions is, are these ads directly to consumer? This is right out of a Ladies Home Journal or Red Book. Is this the best thing we could think of? It reduces the stigma. Everybody's talking about it. It's not just behind closed doors. Or is it profit-making and disease-mongering? Does everybody think their kid has ADHD and you could be smiling at your son if 
the kid took the medication. It's really, in some ways, the world's first, in my sort of closet study of medication ads, child medication ad that's anti-stigma. If you have your child medicated, you don't see those annoying, bothersome behaviors. You see your real child. It's a very powerful message. Here's one from a couple of years later by Shire, you can see, for Adderall XR, extended release. It's another formula to have the pill last throughout a day. What market is it tapping? The adult market, by far the fastest growing market. The kid market for meds for ADHD peaked out a few years ago at about 70% of diagnosed kids get the medicine. But the adult market is skyrocketing, especially women, by far the fastest growing segment of the population. So this is one ad, it's not two put together, different colors in the same uh, magazines. If you really have good eyesight, you can see citations to psychiatric journals. Because if you're an adult with ADHD, you're probably twice as likely to be divorced. On the other hand, or maybe contemporaneously, if you're an adult with ADHD, you're likely to have a relative risk of about two, major depressive disorder. So why not get this treated? It could save your relationship, save you from major depression and suicidal thoughts. Powerful advertisements. Here's our third ad. It's a very big megabyte ad. A little bit of the text got cut off. This is Shane Victorino, the first Hawaiian American to play Major League Baseball. He got a World Series ring with the Phillies in 2009, with the Red Sox in 14. He's been traded twice since. Great ball player, beautiful wife and kids, and some of the other ads. This ad is sponsored by one drug company and two national. ADHD advocacy groups, and what does Shane Victorino say? I didn't outgrow my ADHD, that's why I'm telling my story. Well, why is he telling his story? Well, again, it's an anti-stigma thing. Here's a famous ball player coming out of the closet about his mental disorder, but he also has to tell his story to the Major League Baseball brass and have a diagnosis of ADHD or he couldn't take his stimulants. Because if you don't have an exemption, it's like taking steroids. Taking stimulants would be a performance edge, give you a performance edge. So the moral of the story, I think, is that at the last statistics I've read, twice as many Major League Baseball players have exemptions for ADHD medications as <laughs> NFL or NBA or NHL. Now, it's conceivable that the actual point prevalence of ADHD is double in Major League Baseball as the other sports, or, or are people trying to game the system because what's the real truth here? Baseball is the world's most boring sport. <laughs> I have no bias here. But after a four-hour game in the last inning, if you're playing right field on that sinking line ball, if your attention lapses for a second, the game's gone. Or if that curveball in the bottom of the ninth gets by you. So for a slow game like baseball, which has bursts of need for sustained attention and performance, are people trying to get ADHD diagnoses to get these accommodations and a performance edge. So in some ways, this encapsulates a lot of the current controversy. What's true about this condition? If you're a kid with ADHD, school's hard. You don't focus very well, you're impulsive, everything's more fun than doing schoolwork, and the costs are substantial. Beyond the actual direct costs of treating with medicines and therapies, about 20 billion a year, the so-called indirect cost, or the cost offsets, last year were about 125 billion to the economy for kids, often with special education, it could be substance use, uh, juvenile facilities. And for adults, it's double that, mainly related to poor employment histories. Say, it's going in and out, I'll move it up a little bit. Unemployment compensation, workers' comp, time off work. So even in this era of inflated numbers we read about in the business pages, these are big numbers. ADHD is costly. Kids in grade school dislike other kids with ADHD more than they dislike any other group of kids with a mental health condition. More than depressed kids, more than autistic kids, more than aggressive kids. And why would that be? Kids with ADHD seem like they kind of have it together most of the time, but that's the issue. These are the kids 
get very excited at the party and blow out the candles, but it wasn't their birthday party. It was the <laughs> other kid's party. That poor impulse control, those social gaffes, are in some ways unforgivable to kids. So why does this matter? From studies done decades ago, not of clinical populations, but of whole school districts, whole counties, the team would go in, the psychiatrist would do an evaluation, the psychologist would, they'd get rating scales, they'd do achievement tests, get IQ scores. What was the single biggest predictor in those studies 15, 20, 25, 30 years later of school dropout, being in juvenile hall, or needing mental health treatment? The proportion of second grade classmates who didn't want to be your friend. Second graders were the best assessors. They were the ones who knew who didn't fit in very well socially, or the kids who were too aggressive, et cetera. So is it that we should hire second graders on our assessment teams? <laughs> Are they just really sensitive? Or is there something about being rejected by your peer group that over and above the problems that led to that rejection predict dropout, delinquency, mental health services? And it turns out to be yes, both of the above. Because even if you take into account statistically the kinds of problems the kids have that lead to that rejection in second grade, the act of being expelled from the peer group predicts all those difficult outcomes later on. So if ADHD is the king of the hill, more kids dislike kids with ADHD, this is some of these economic problems are happening later. What about families? We'll have more to say about this. There's no good evidence short of utter deprivation, say in a Romanian orphanage, that early difficult parenting causes these symptoms. But the family's discipline style can exacerbate them or temper them. A primary cause versus a maintaining cause. Five-year-olds and below with serious ADHD symptoms are five to six more likely, times more likely to die than their peers because they swallow poisons and they get hit by cars and they fall from high places. 16 plus year olds with ADHD are five to six times more likely to have serious motor vehicle accidents, DUIs, and fatalities. We know this because our colleague Russ Barkley, 20 years ago when he worked at University of Massachusetts Medical Center, got the DMV in Massachusetts for a full year to add an ADHD symptom checklist to the online registration for your renewal of your licenses. So he had ongoing data, past and future, related to the amount of symptoms and both the impulse control problems and the attentional lapses independently and jointly predict serious problems behind a wheel. Many little kids with ADHD are fairly ornery. Some are anxious. Over time, more and more of them become more seriously aggressive, more seriously depressed. The rate of substance abuse in an ADHD sample is about three times the national average. And as we'll see, especially for girls, taking it out against herself in the form of self-injury is another huge risk. ADHD is a lot like blood pressure. It's on a bell curve. There's no magic place above which you got it and below which you don't. It's on a spectrum. Autism's on a spectrum. Blood pressure's on a spectrum. Even schizophrenia is on a spectrum. Where do you draw the line? This is a huge issue that we don't have enough time to talk about. What is going on inside the heads and brains of these kids, and then adults. In 1980, the name changed from hyperactivity to ADD, attention deficit disorder, and soon after to ADHD. Do kids with ADHD really have an attention deficit? It depends on how you define attention. Sustained attention. If I go on long enough, you'll all be fast asleep in these chairs. How long can you keep aroused and alert. So the theory was that people with ADHD fall asleep quicker, except for the research that showed a decade and more ago that even from the first second or two on of learning a task, people with ADHD had a different information processing style. So it was maybe it's not sustained, but selective attention. 
believe me, it's overtime in the Warriors game, but I'm talking to you. I am exerting selective attention like I never have. It's an incredible task. Or maybe it's attentional capacity. Six, nine, four, one, eight, seven. Could you say those numbers backwards? Well, it's a test. You've got to do it. Working memory. Can you retain bits of information and then manipulate those bits and do something with it? It's another kind of attention or attentional capacity that seems to be a core deficit in many, but not all people with ADHD. And then the broader concept is EF, executive functions. What separates us from the other primates? The debate goes on. We're not always smarter, we're certainly not stronger, but we can usually get up and plan a day and keep at it and change gears if we need to. Those are the executive functions, the executive sitting upstairs in your brain. And a majority of people with ADHD do very poorly on these executive function tasks. But 40% of people with exactly the same symptoms do perfectly fine. It's not, not a deficit for everyone. So Russ Barkley, whom I mentioned before, our colleague now in South Carolina, uh, a big person in the ADHD field, said, no, 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 the executive functions are important, but they come a bit later. What's really important is inhibitory control. Remember, those candles are on that icing-filled cake and smoke, is and you've got to inhibit that impulse to remember it's not your party. And if you can't inhibit that impulse for a half a second, you'll never get a chance to use your working memory and your planning and all these other capacities. Now the problem, to get technical, is some neuropsychologists say that inhibition is an executive function. It's not something separate that comes before. So the debate goes on in the journals. An old theory of ADHD is making a major comeback, which has to do with motivation and inhibition, and especially reward. So separate from inhibition a bit. Maybe people with ADHD are just not very good at developing that sense of intrinsic motivation that most of us do because there's not enough dopamine flowing in the right places in the brain and they need those regular rewards or maybe that's why they need the stimulants. Now it's a fascinating theory. Some interesting evidence occurred when Nora Volkow, the director of National Institute on Drug Abuse, who makes her other living as a PET scanner, uh, found after a six and a half year search about 65 adults with very clear ADHD who'd never taken medicine a day in their lives and had no other mental disorders, no comorbidities, and found a matched comparison group of about the same size and put them in the PET scanner and they counted, the team counted, the number of receptors for dopamine. They actually counted. And in the reward processing areas of the brain and in the lower brain regions that project out to the frontal lobes that you pay attention and perform executive functions, the ADHD group had 40% fewer receptors for dopamine than the control group. And it wasn't because they'd been on medication for a long time and had burned out those receptors. So there may be a subgroup of adults with ADHD who have some kind of inborn deficit that makes it hard for them to stay aroused and alert and intrinsically motivated. It's not everybody. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about different models and different brain regions and pathways that might underlie these symptoms in different people. Phil Shaw has done an amazing series of studies. Let's look at the picture. He focuses on the prefrontal cortex. So what is cortex? Greek for bark, the outer layer. The coating of the brain, a few millimeters thick. When does the prefrontal cortex during childhood reach its maximum thickness? The age of six years. And then it recedes and comes back. The whole frontal lobes reach their maximum capacity at 25, but we'll get to that. So, it's kind of interesting that societies a long time ago started educating six-year-olds and sending them to school. Nobody had brain scanning back then, but people said, hey, it's probably a good time for kids to be learning, right? 
Of course, now we make kids learn earlier and earlier, which may be another thing. In a cubic millimeter of the prefrontal cortex, so think of a millimeter ruler. A cubic millimeter is a box. It's a small little box. How many neurons occur or appear in a cubic millimeter of prefrontal cortex? Between 50 and 75 million. The brain's really complicated. In the world's first developmental neuroimaging study using MRIs, Shaw and his colleagues got 237 kids with ADHD and 237 typically developing kids. And lo and behold, the typically developing kids, by the age of six, their prefrontal cortices had reached that maximum thickness. And what about the kids with ADHD? Three to three and a half years late. Their cortices did not fully mature until nine to nine and a half. So people said, back in 2006 and 7, when the first studies came out, well, it's just a lag of a few years. As they followed the sample on into adolescence, what happens in adolescence? Your prefrontal cortex thins and prunes. That's the normal course. And the kids with ADHD remain several years behind. The lag in thickening and thinning correlates massively with the number of symptoms of ADHD these kids have. So it's another biological mechanism. Is it some gene or set of genes that's awry? Is it something prenatal? Is it something about the early environment that is epigenetically expressing these genes? We don't know. But the biological research is hot and heavy with ADHD these days. In fact, the term used is called heritability from twin and adoption studies. Why am I so scattered and you're so focused? Why are some people really erratic and some people really conscientious? Is it mainly genes? Is it mainly environments or about 50-50? Heritability is the statistic that puts it as a percentage. What's the heritability of height? 92%. My average height parents, genes made me an average height adult ruined my basketball career, <laughs> damn them. What's the heritability of major depression? The tendency to have very severe depressive mood states. About 30% in men and 40% in women. Genes have a substantial amount to do with it, but more of the differences between people in this tendency are environmental. What about for schizophrenia? 65%. Genes have a lot to do with it. What about for the symptoms of ADHD we're talking about? 75 to 80%. ADHD is more genetically based, if you will, than schizophrenia or depression. It approaches bipolar illness and autism, which are the two largest that we know of in clinical psychology and psychiatry. Well, it's all in the genes. Nothing you can do about it. Wrong. Even 100% heritable conditions, single gene disorders, can be treated with the right environment or the right diet or the right conditions. Biology is not necessarily destiny. What's the real cause of ADHD? Compulsory education. <laughs> when we made kids start going to school 150, 200 years ago, I said it tongue in cheek, it's not the cause, it's the revealer. Now everybody's got to do things that the human brain never evolved to do. Learn to read and sit still for ungodly periods of time in straight back chairs in one room schoolhouses. So if you've got the genotype that makes it hard for you to focus, maybe it wasn't so noticeable in the hunter-gatherer society or on the farm, but it's really noticeable now. So it's fascinating that the clinical literature in psychology and psychiatry began to be written about ADHD, was then called something else, hyperactivity or whatever else, was almost contemporaneous with the beginning of compulsory education. Which genes are involved? This was the quest. Three decades ago, even two decades ago, we were going the gene for bipolar illness, the, the gene for schizophrenia, the, maybe the gene for ADHD. It's a false search. There's no one gene. There's no 10 or 20 or 50, maybe not even 100 for these conditions. They're polygenic. And if you read the psychiatric epidemiology and psychiatric genetics literature in the last couple of years, 
Now they've got samples of 10, 20, 50,000 internationally, and the most amazing thing is happening. The genes, the set of them that confer risk for ADHD are the same genes that confer risk for autism, schizophrenia, depression, and bipolar disorder. These are basic building block of the brain genes that are expressed through development differently to lead to different symptoms. There's no magic genetic bullet for these conditions. The more we know about genetics, it's more confusing, going to be more powerful as we know more, but let's not go down the road to think that either genes are destiny or there's a single gene for any of these disorders. So on your continuing education quiz, you must pass to leave the library tonight. There's two big terms, equifinality. Maybe an outcome like depression, like ADHD, like dementia, looks the same across people, but in case one, there was a substantial genetic loading. In case two, it was a very early traumatic environment. In case three, dot, 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 another set of causal factors, and of course these can overlap. So what looks like one disorder may be many. What we now call ADHD, I'm fairly confident in several decades, will be shown to have constituted 12 or 15 or 18 somewhat differentiable conditions. This is true in the history of neurology and psychiatry. And the other big term is multifinality. I don't like the term here, cause, let's say risk factor or early sign, a temperament you have, whether you're securely attached, whether you're born with a lot of ADHD kinds of symptoms. Does everybody grow up the same? No. Some people thrive. Some people are hugely hampered. Other people have a more mixed picture, depending on not just the genotype, but on parenting and schooling and cultural context and promotion of resilience. The more we know about mental health and mental illness, there's no fixed categories, there's no single causes, and things are more complicated than we thought. Remember back to the first slide, multiple levels of analysis. So what about parents? Well, one thing we should think of right now, if the heritability of ADHD is as high as we're saying, about 40 to 50% of biological parents of kids with ADHD have the symptoms themselves, whether or not diagnosed. What do you have to do to be the parent of a kid with ADHD? You have to be a super parent. Don't raise your voice. Be very clear. Always follow through on rewards. Keep a calm demeanor at all times. <laughs> what if you yourself aren't so good at balancing your checkbook and aren't very good at regulating your emotions and the house isn't the most organized you've ever seen? Genes and environments are going to correlate together. We know that if parents of kids with the more impulsive varieties of ADHD tend to get into it with the kids, gasoline is right on those flames. We'll have some examples. One of the fancy terms is called coercion, invented by Jerry Patterson, our psychologist colleague up in Eugene, Oregon. The repeated chains of give in, give in, give in, and then come down way too hard, repeated by parent and child, these coercive cycles of discipline are the roadmap to conduct problems, the roadmap to juvenile hall. So whatever your thoughts are about medication for ADHD in kids, if you don't work with the families pretty darn hard to change strategies of discipline at home, you're missing the boat. So we did a study on this almost 20 years ago. It got published in Child Development, a big fancy developmental psych journal that never used to really like stuff on depression or ADHD. The goal of this study was across our boys' summer camps to figure out what predicted who was popular at the end of the summer, who had pretty socially competent among the other boys with ADHD in the control group we had there right alongside them. So we measured behavior every day, we had a big equation putting all the behaviors, and we wanted to measure parenting so we put into the equation the worst measure in the world of measuring parenting, which is giving parents a rating scale about their own parenting behaviors. <laughs> I myself 
have never yelled at our three boys. I'm always delivered rewards. I've always picked them up at time. You can just look at my rating scale. I filled out. <laughs> it's on file. However, so, so what do you do? You observe families in the clinic. You videotape in the playroom. Uh, you have a clinician's judgment. It's far better. But there was a rating scale floating around Berkeley, helped by Diana Baumrind, our venerable uh, parenting specialist with Trudy Hemming and the Cowans, and they called it the ideas about parenting scale. What was sort of cool about it was it was harder to fake good. So from the scale, we derived 15 items, here's a sampling, that measure what we call authoritative parenting. Across the literature and developmental psychology, multiple cultures, it's pretty clear that parents vary on two fundamental dimensions. Do you love being a parent? Are you warm and responsive? Or not so much. That's the x-axis. And on the y-axis, intriguingly, at right angles, not correlated at all, how much limits do you, how many limits do you set? How controlling are you? Versus, eh, kids will figure it out themselves. So because they're uncorrelated, it forms nice little quadrants. And the ideal is thought to be, for many families, you're warm and responsive and you're not afraid to set limits. Seems to be correlated with academic and social outcomes. What if you're warm but not so limit setting? That's what we call Berkeley in the 60s parenting. <laughs> the kids are either creative geniuses or they've ransacked the house. Maybe some parents know that some kids can have a little more rope. It's interesting. What if you're not so warm, so you're on the left, but very controlling authoritarian, more of a disciplinary style? Maybe the kids are too compliant. Maybe the kids rebel. Among African-American samples, authoritarian parenting is more correlated with good outcomes than in white samples. Maybe historical reasons for this. And what's the worst? No warmth, no control, uninvolved, all the way to neglectful. You don't want to have to make this choice. But if you had to choose a child being physically abused, sexually abused, or neglected, neglect is far, by far the worst, cognitively, socially, over a long period of time. So let's go back. Here's some of the items on the scale measuring authoritative parenting. Warm, responsive, and a couple of other features. These are parents who push for autonomy. They're also parents who reason with their kids about limits and misbehavior, but not after the kids misbehaved. That's called rewarding the kid. This is in neutral moments saying, here's why we've got these rules. And you've got your space in your room, and I've got my space, and I've got rights as a parent, you've got rights as a kid. So it's warmth and limits and autonomy encouragement and pushing for independence and reasoning. So what did we find? We first found that the primary parents, usually mothers, of our group of boys with ADHD scored far lower on this factor than the control group moms. In the margins of the questionnaires, they would write, warm? We haven't had a positive interaction in the last five years. Limits? We just let him do his thing. We don't want his sister to get hurt. We don't want any fights. It's hard to be an authoritative parent when you've got a kid what do a lot of kids with ADHD look like? They're the kids who gave up naps at 1, pulled down the curtains 5 in the morning between 2 and 3, have been thrown out of several preschools by 4 or 5. It's tough. But what if you can maintain those authoritative beliefs and practices even if your kid's got ADHD? Because we found that the variability was very high. There are some parents of kids with ADHD who scored just as high as the highest in the control group. And so what did we find? The only significant predictor of the kid's popularity and competence at the end of the, so, of the camp socially was the primary parent's score on authoritative parenting. All of the behaviors we observed every friggin' day of the camp didn't really predict it that much. What's the problem with this study? Well, we had wanted to randomly assign a group of boys with ADHD to live in certain households for the next 10 years. But the <laughs> ethics board at Berkeley was a little stodgy. Maybe there's a gene that predicts authoritative parenting and also predicts social competence in kids. I mean, these are linked. 
So our friend Gordon Harold in the UK has helped us, and he published two years ago this month two studies based on adoption samples in England. No biological relatedness between parent and kid. And what did he find? The young kids, the subsample with clear ADHD by five, six, and seven, had driven their parents fairly mad, and the parents were getting critical and harsh. And the level of critical, harsh parenting and lax parenting predicted those symptoms maintenance over five to seven years. In unrelated families, unrelated biologically between parent and kid, it's not just the genes. It's the environment in which you're raised and in which you develop a sense of self and competence that also matters a lot to outcome for these kids. Very quickly, we did a study also, this is 20 years plus ago at UCLA before I moved up here, to figure out how long it would take, remember these peer reputations are quite important, how long does it take for boys with ADHD to get rejected by their peers? And the answer was three hours. Because we had a summer camp, none of the boys knew one another before they came in, half ADHD, half comparison. We measured their behaviors from the first morning. They had numbers on their jerseys, like the Warriors, et cetera, et cetera. And the first afternoon, and the third, and the fifth, and every week thereafter, we'd pull the boys out for a little one-on-one -on -one interview with a picture board. Who are the three boys you'd like to be friends with the most, the kids you'd really not like to be friends with the most? By the afternoon of the first day, the boys with ADHD were five times more likely never to get picked as friends. It took three hours. We also correlated that score at the end of the first afternoon with the overall six weeks later popularity score or rejection score of the kids. The correlation was 0.7. That's a very high correlation. Meaning what? It's hard to overcome a difficult reputation, isn't it? Think of the workplace, think of family reunions, think of everything you can think of. So one of the clinical implications is, if you're working with kids with this condition, and they're doing well on their treatment, like medicine or a good home reward program, don't do what too many clinicians do and say, let's start the school year med-free. Let's start the school year without the rewards and see how long it takes him or her to need them. Three hours. It's too late in mid-September when the principal's calling. So the other question is, in the essence of Drew Earhart's dissertation, what was happening? What predicted this? We measured everything. We measured the kids' attractiveness. We had other people rate how good-looking the boys were. We measured their academic skills and athletic skills. Didn't predict these first-day, third-day negative <coughs> peer reputations. How pro-socially did they behave each day at the camp? Didn't predict. How withdrawn and depressed did they act? Not at all. What predicted was, what explained half of this, which is a huge proportion of variance, is how aggressive and ornery were the kids that first morning? So kids with ADHD tend to have impulsive aggression. They're crybabies and they're reactive. And so to talks with parents, I'll sometimes say, lovingly but pointedly, if you want your kid to develop a bad reputation early in a summer camp, make sure they argue with the ump after getting called out in softball. <laughs> make sure they throw a lot of spitballs in the classroom and they tease back and swear at their peers who tease them. Those are the things that are guaranteed to develop that quick reputation that's hard to shake. What about girls? In grad school, down at good old UCLA, I learned three decades ago that Girls don't get ADHD, it's a boy's condition. 20 years ago, our team wrote a grant to the National Institute of Mental Health. They weren't so sure they liked it, we wrote it again and it got the top rank score at NIMH that year. We wanted to set about using the summer camp methodologies to understand what ADHD looked like in girls. And it's a long story. When we published our first paper in 2002, it took a couple years to analyze the data after these camps in the late 90s, that day, we doubled the world's literature on girls with ADHD. And it's not that big a sample. 140 with ADHD, 88 comparisons. This had essentially not been studied scientifically. And we call it the B-GALS study, the Berkeley Girls with ADHD Longitudinal Study, because you can only get five years of funding at a time. But we told the families when they first came in, we would like to follow your daughters for the rest of their lives. <laughs> 
So, so far, we ran the camps when they were little, and we followed them when they were in their teen years, and we followed them in their emerging adult years, and we just finished our 16-year follow-up when they were between about 24 and 29 years of age. Very diverse, fourth wave just completed, and we have the luxury of doing very long assessments, so we really learned a lot about them. A longitudinal study is humbling because you have to repeat a lot of the measures you started with. Otherwise, you can't compare. So you realize forever how dumb you were when you started a study because you chose the wrong measures. But you're allowed to add measures to developmentally match where the kids are going. So starting in this early adulthood, wave three, we started to ask in questionnaires and interviews questions about a very difficult topic of self-harm. Do you feel like dying? Do you think about it a lot, or have you actually made an attempt? So suicidal ideation and behavior. And then the other category that's in the news, of course, a lot now, you don't want to die overtly, but you've got a lot of deep pain, and you're cutting or burning or mutilating non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Goes by different terms. Theoretically, they're distinct, right? Because I either want to kill myself or I don't. I've got another reason for harming myself. If you look at samples of people in their 20s, especially females, who are attempting suicide, what's the single biggest predictor? A history of non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. You get inured to it. Gets, and the, the rates are now getting very high. So what did we find? At the average age of 20, remember when they were in the summer camps 10 years before, some of them, the dark green, had had what we call the combined form of ADHD. ADHD with a lot of impulsivity and hyperactivity, not just inattention. Some were just more purely inattentive, the old ADD without hyperactivity, and our control group. 23% of the girls with the combined, i.e. impulsive form of ADHD, had attempted to kill herself by the age of 20. 8% of the purely inattentive, and 6% of our normally typically developing girls. 6% of typically developing? Maybe this is Berkeley, maybe this is the Bay Area. That's the national average. No difference here. When we go to the other category, this is moderate to severe, cutting, burning, banging your head against a radiator, harming yourself. 51% of the originally combined, i.e. impulsive girls, were actively involved about a quarter of the inattentive, and 19% of our normative comparison group. 19% is the national average. It's an epidemic these days. There is some contagion, but it's thought of mainly as very poor emotion regulation abilities. So what do researchers do when they have longitudinal data? Try to figure out patterns. Try to figure out explanations. Erica Swanson did her dissertation a couple of years ago in our lab, now published a series of studies on this. So when they were girls, we had an ADHD group and a comparison group. When they were young adults, about 20, the first variable here is how severely they're self-injuring. And then what's in the middle? We measured stuff during adolescence. What carried the day? It's called a mediator test. What explained this relation between early ADHD and impulsivity and later cutting and burning. The girl's poor inhibition on a neuropsych test and her parent and teacher rated aggression. What explained alternatively those girls who had actually tried to end their lives was their adolescent parent and teacher and self-rated anxiety and depression. So there's a difference. Again, you can't think of these things as totally distinct Poor inhibition and acting out are predicting the cutting. Anxiety and depression are predicting the suicide attempt. Jocelyn Meza did her master's thesis, got it published earlier this year in our lab. She thought what really matters to a teenager is how accepted you are in a peer group. So using a different set of mediators in adolescence, she found that the girls' perceptions of how much other kids were victimizing them, either physically or verbally. That explained 
the levels of severity of the cutting and burning. But the teacher's perceptions in middle school of this girl is on the outs, nobody wants to play with her. The actual peer rejection, the opposite of preference, that was the explanatory factor for suicide. So peers matter, but the victim is, excuse me, the victimization seemed to matter more for the non-suicidal injury and the preference or the, the flip of that, the rejection for the suicidality. Maya Gundelman in our lab, who's now an intern at UCLA, spent a year training a team of coders to go back through our charts and look for, because we knew these girls and they were fairly young, instances of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or neglect, and got very reliable coding of this. She found, not too surprisingly, that the girls with ADHD had a greater tendency for those trauma-related uh, experience than our comparison group. But more importantly, within the group of girls with ADHD, think of the biological risk we've been talking about. If you've been physically or sexually abused or neglected, the rate of suicide attempt now goes up to 35%. We know this is true for a very heritable condition called bipolar disorder. Genes matter a lot as to why some people have these manias and depressions and, and most people don't. But if you have bipolar disorder and a history of physical or sexual abuse, you have an earlier onset of symptoms on average and a much more difficult to treat set of symptoms. If you've got the biological tendency toward ADHD and you've received trauma, the rate of suicide is now over a third. Genes and environments work together. They're not something separate. We didn't have a big enough sample to say, well, was it the physical abuse or the sexual abuse or the neglect, and often they overlapped, we would need a, a sample probably 10 times bigger. So if you're still alert, your sustained attention seems good so far, <laughs> ADHD is not a category in the diagnostic system. It's a very dynamic set of processes. Many different causes can eventuate in ADHD symptoms. Remember, equifinality. Outcomes differ a lot, multifinality. Families matter, peers matter. Executive function matters. I didn't show how these early measures of executive functions uh, we gave to the girls during grade school, during the summer camps, were very strong predictors of, of many of these outcomes. Development matters, genes matters, context matters. That's what we're talking about. So now, let's go to controversy. Is there really more ADHD diagnosed today than 10 years ago? Yes. How do we know? The Centers for Disease Control started to get interested in ADHD and autism back in about 2000. I and some colleagues of mine from around the country were flown to Atlanta, good barbecue, and met with the CDC people to try, and try to inform them about, well, what kind of measures would they need if they weren't just gonna do whooping, cough, and flu, and HIV, but neurodevelopmental disorders. So one of the things they did was add questions on to the NSCH, the National Survey of Children's Health. Every few years, 100,000 families are random dialed. Now it's not just dial phones, landlines, it's cell phones too, it's good for representative samples. And one of the questions now is, is there a child in this home between the age of four and 17 that has been diagnosed by a professional with ADHD or a professional has told you your kid has ADD or ADHD? That number was 7.8% of all kids in 2003, 9.5%, four years later, five years later, 11%. That's a 41% increase in nine years. That's an epidemic, but again, it's not contagious. Is that true? Is there really more? Or is it what's called diagnosed prevalence? Are we diagnosing it more and more when it may not really be true? Interestingly, the rates of medication stayed the same. About 68, 69, 70%. The child market for meds has kind of peaked. The adult market's going up. Now, this is interesting and troubling. But what's really screwy is state-by-state -state variation. In 2011-12, the top three states for diagnosis are Arkansas, North Carolina, and Indiana. And if you're a boy in those states above 11, above 10, so 11 and up, the odds of being diagnosed with ADHD in your lifetime are 30 to 35%. So one in three 
But we're way behind out west. <laughs> we diagnose it as much. Now, what about medication? So the question now is, your kid's been diagnosed. Does he or she receive one of these medications for ADHD? Now the high rates, four-fifths or more, it's not just the South, it's the Midwest, it's the Plains in Texas, it's Vermont. Must be Bernie Sanders, we're not sure. A lot of <laughs> hypotheses about this. But again, California and Nevada are among the lowest. So in health economics and medicine, this is called small area variation. Why in some regions, almost town to town, county to county, do some women get hysterectomies at the rate of 40% and the next town 10%? Or tonsillectomies, 80% versus 20%. So why are these rates of diagnosis so disparate across the states? So it must be demographics. More Hispanic people in California than North Carolina. So in the ADHD explosion book, Richard Scheffler and I did kind of case studies. North Carolina, high rate state, California, low rate state. Many more African Americans out here, many, uh, I'm sorry, Hispanics in California, many more African Americans in North Carolina. So what health economists do is kind of awesome. If you watch election night on CNN and you see the guys and gals kind of wipe the state slate clean, you can pretend that every state has the same gender ratio and the same ratio of ethnic groups. And when we did that, we found that North Carolina still had twice as many kids diagnosed. So it's not just who lives there. Well, it must be the rates of providers, because for many illnesses, county by county in the United States, people get diagnosed more where there's more providers. Do the people go to the providers? The providers go to them? No correlation for ADHD. No relation at all. So it has to be culture. We're rugged individualists out here. And North Carolina is a culture of honor. It's already a stereotype. The research triangle is probably pretty similar to the Silicon Valley. Rural California is pretty similar to rural North Carolina. We couldn't find anything that would explain a state-by-state -state difference until, this is a true story, Richard and I were talking one day, my co-author, a health economist at Berkeley, and he said, didn't you once say in a talk that the, quote, cause of ADHD was compulsory education? Maybe it has to do with performance expectations in schooling. So we looked at consequential accountability. In 1983, the Bell Commission published a report saying, which we've been hearing for the last 30 years, America's falling behind in its course. All the things we did in the 70s, class size, more science than curriculum, more working, we've got to incentivize test scores. So states started in the 80s and 90s to pass laws that basically said what? No funding for your district, or your district gets written up, or it goes into receivership, unless those test scores are going up. So those are called consequential accountability laws. The school's accountable and there's a consequence if the scores aren't going up. 30 states had passed those laws by 2000. They're mainly in the South. Circumstantial evidence, those are already high rate states of diagnosis. But what happened in November of 2000? Bush got elected, or did he? No, he did, right? It was close. <laughs> and he did, and first major piece of domestic legislation was No Child Left Behind, which you've read about this week, is now being totally dismantled. But one of the provisions of No Child Left Behind, which took effect in the 2002-03 school year, was what? Consequential accountability is now the federal standard. So Richard and I licked our lips. This is a natural experiment. 30 states have these laws before, and we can look at their rates of ADHD diagnosis in 2003. That's our base year. 20 states that year now have accountability. What's going to happen in the next four years? And our prediction was that the poorest kids in those states would start to get diagnosed because No Child Left Behind focused on Title I public schools with high minority populations. So what did we find? Between 2003 and 7. The 21, why is it 21? Because DC was included in addition to 20 states, that suddenly got accountability through No Child Left Behind. For the kids in those states within 200% of the federal poverty level, their rates of ADHD diagnoses went up 58% in four years. The middle and upper class kids in those states went up the national average of about 20%, and the kids at private schools in those states who are not subject to No Child Left Behind went up about 12%. This is what the policymakers call an unintended consequence. 
an unintended effect. Nobody passed No Child Left Behind to raise rates of ADHD diagnosis. It was to make kids smarter and do better on tests. But if you incentivize achievement above all else, what would be the benefit of getting a kid diagnosed with ADHD? Well, number one, they might get medicine or treatment, boost their scores. But in a much more nefarious scenario, in many regions of the country, if you get a kid with ADHD, a kid diagnosed with ADHD, they're in the special ed category, and their scores are removed from the district's test score average. How do you raise the mean of a distribution? Take out the lowest scores. So policy matters. Doesn't matter for the true prevalence of ADHD, but it matters for the diagnosed prevalence. And what's the number one issue here? How do you get a kid diagnosed with ADHD these days? About 12 minutes in a pediatrician's office. No interviewing, no rating scales, no evidence-based standards. A lot of things look like ADHD. It takes a couple of hours to do this right. Of course, with our federal grants, we have a 10-hour battery when we do this. No one can afford that. But we're going to pay now or pay later. And one of the prices of these quick and dirty diagnoses is massive overdiagnosis. But another one is underdiagnosis. Because the doctor says, well, she's sitting there fine in the chair in the waiting room. She can't have ADHD. Well, the parents tell me video games for five consecutive hours. He doesn't have an attention deficit. ADHD is not an attention deficit. It's a dysregulation in the allocation of attention. Too little when the teacher's talking, too much when you've got a video screen in front of you. Because what do we know about ADHD and gaming? Kids with ADHD are hooked on it. They look like they're doing great and they perform much worse than typically developing kids. It's a false sense of attention. Now, we don't have much longer before we take questions. Very briefly on treatment, what do you do? The stimulant medications are quite effective at reducing the symptoms. And the kind of psychological treatment known as behavior mod or cognitive behavioral therapy, working to get a more regular system of rewards for kids, and working with adults on time management and organization and challenging their negative beliefs are the evidence-based treatments. Neurofeedback is a very intuitive approach. You, say, you put the electrodes on me, and as I'm focusing attention, the screen turns a nice green. It may be, though, that it's a big placebo effect, because the current trial going on, looking at neurofeedback versus no treatment versus fake neurofeedback. You're hooked up for 20 sessions to the machine, but the feedback coming back to you is not correlated to your brain waves, was just as effective for the first 50 cases. Diet, Dr. Feingold started the Feingold diet at Oakland Kaiser 45 years ago. He said it was a 70% cure rate. He didn't have a control group, big problem. <laughs> when the interveners went in and changed all the foodstuffs in the house, in a double-blind way, only about 5% of kids seem to respond. But the newer data, especially from England, suggests it's not sugar, but it's the additives and dyes. They may be adding a symptom or two to kids who are vulnerable. So part of a holistic treatment would be to have kids on a good diet, but don't do what too many families in the Bay Area do, which is say, I'm all for groovy organic diets, and I'm not going to get my kid assessed, and why would I do medicine? No reward programs in schools. It's a lot of years wasted to realize that diet wasn't the only thing going on. And the big new craze is specific cognitive training. It has some value in schizophrenia. It has some value in other conditions. For ADHD, the idea is let's increase your working memory. Six, nine, three. We, we'd practice that. We'd do games, and you'd increase your digit span. You can train people with ADHD to have longer digit spans. It doesn't seem to matter for homework or soccer or home. It doesn't bridge the gap yet. That's the biggest issue. What are these stimulant medicines? Stimulants is a bad word. They're SDRIs. They're SNDRIs. Everybody knows what an SSRI is, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It stops the serotonin from getting gobbled back in the presynaptic nerve terminal. Stimulants do the same thing, but for dopamine and norepinephrine rather than serotonin. So you get a boost of dopamine right in those reward pathways, right in those attentional pathways. The stimulants have the biggest response rate of any condition in psychiatry. If you get the right pill, and if you get the right dose, you get about an 80% response, only 15 on placebo. What's true for child and adolescent depression? 
you maybe on a good day get a 50% response on medication and you get a 35 to 38 response rate on placebo. It's statistically significant, but it's small. If you want to reduce the symptoms of ADHD, the stimulants really help. Do they teach skills? Do they improve parenting? Do they teach reading? No, you need to combine. And that's what the behavioral interventions for kids do. Regularize the rewards, take the emotion out of parenting, more individualized goals for kids at school. We don't have time to get into it. All the things you can do. In the big MTA study we did some years ago at Berkeley and five other centers around the country, the outcome measure is symptoms of ADHD, symptoms of aggression, symptoms of depression, reading and math scores, parenting at home, popularity and friendship at school. Only the dark purple, only the combination of well-delivered medicine plus 14 months of home, school, and summer camp behavioral intervention taught the kids the skills and reduced their impairment. If you want to reduce the symptoms, medicines are often perfectly adequate. If you want to teach competency, they're not enough. And as we sometimes say, we have really done in the Bay Area, in this search, we've worked with all of the kids with ADHD who have no other learning and emotional problems, who do fine just on medication. And both of those kids are doing great. Everybody else <laughs> is having problems. In the real world, trouble goes with trouble. We're going to have to skip this, and we're going to talk about the final point, which is diversion. What about the astronomical rates of stimulant use at Drake and TAM, et cetera, and in most, colleges camp most college campuses now? You can find stimulants in the medicine cabinet of your roommate or the person down the hall, and five bucks a tab for Adderall is a pretty good price these days. Why not? We do it for fluoride. It's in the water supply. We do it with coffee. I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. I'm a statistical outlier, but most people do. Why shouldn't everybody have access to stimulants? You do better in your test scores. Our national intelligence would rise. Well, if you are a college student or a high school student, if you take that stimulant, you will stay up late and probably finish that term paper. Will you learn better? Well, it depends on what you mean by learning. So it took Martha Farah and her team to do the world's first study in late 2013 of normally developing college students taking stimulants a week at a time and then placebo, a randomized schedule. And each week you'd get part of a battery of tests. There were 13 tests in all working memory, verbal retention, spatial memory, creative divergent thinking. How many of those 13 tests did the stimulants improve in the normal college students? Zero. But they had a 14th measure, which is a rating scale as to how well you thought you did on your tests that week. <laughs> and there was a huge effect. So their conclusion in their discussion section is that stimulants in normative college students are very good at boosting false self-confidence in learning abilities, not real learning. Do stimulants help kids with ADHD to learn? It again depends on how you measure learning. So let's go back to the bell curve. If you're really inattentive and impulsive, the stimulants don't just help you stay up later, they help you process information better. It's pretty clear. If you're in the middle of the bell curve, most everybody, stimulants stay up later, they don't help your learning very much at all. What if you're already on the end of the bell curve where you're highly intrinsically motivated? Stimulants ruin your learning. They put you in a hyper dopaminergic state and you're anxious. And so the overall average effect is minuscule. But what's the real catch? Emergency department stimulant admissions in the United States went up 358% between 2010 and 2013. Stimulant use, if you have ADHD as a kid, as a teen especially, or an adult, and you've got a good doctor following you, what are the odds that you'll get addicted to those stimulants? Because they can be addictive. Maybe one in 100 or one in 1,000. It may be that some of the genes for ADHD actually protect and don't give you the same buzz that many people get on stimulants. 
But what if you're Joe or Jane College? You didn't get stimulants as a kid. Nobody told you to do it. Gee, I can stay up later. I can maybe good for partying. I can do better on my test scores. What happens with those stimulants? About a 15% risk of addiction. And what does stimulant addiction, even to Ritalin and Adderall, look like? Two words, breaking bad. It's the same stuff. Methamphetamine is the same essential stuff as dextroamphetamine and methylphenidate. It's obviously more chance for a high if you crush it and snort it or inject it. But you can get addicted to the oral doses too. So I try not to be too moral about things, but I think the idea that we can boost the national intelligence and achievement by letting everybody just have stimulants, it's not that big a deal, is actually a big deal and it's quite harmful. And uh, I'm glad to talk about that in question and answers. Final, final point, stigma. If we had more time, well, actually, we're taking a break and we start again from 8.30 to 11. So please <laughs> stick around if you'd like. We talk about why mental health issues still receive the, receive the stigma, and stigma they do in the United States. And I wrote a book on this topic, also by Oxford Press, eight years ago, called The Mark of Shame. Who painted the painting I selected for the cover? Hieronymus Bosch. And what's the name of the painting? The Extraction of the Stone of Folly. The Extraction of the Stone of Madness. In Northern Europe, late 15th century, this is a 1496 painting hanging in the Prado. One of the prevalent beliefs that mental illness, about mental illness it was caused by a stone in the head. So the surgeon, but he's wearing a wizard hat, so we know something's up already, right? <laughs> Bosch was an interesting painter. Is trefining, putting a hole in the man's skull to extract the stone. The priest with the chalice is giving a blessing. The patient is giving us direct eye contact. Only one. <laughs> Look carefully. It's an old painting and it's a PowerPoint and there's this big glary light here. It doesn't look like a stone is emerging from the scalpel. There's three little white petals. And what Bosch was painting was the removal of a tulip from the gentleman's head. What was the name of mental illness in Holland in 1496? You were called a tulip head. And Bosch was a satirist the way Swift was a century later writing in Ireland. Maybe if you removed the label, the tulip, took the tulip out of the head, maybe that would solve the problem. Is labeling dehumanizing or does it give you a license to treatment? It's a very modern painting 600 years later. Of course, everybody talks about mental health now. The Times writes about it, the Chronicle writes about it. Stigma's going down, right? Knowledge about mental health has increased vastly in the US over the last 60 years. High school psychology courses, more media. And at the same time, three times more people today believe that mental illness is equated with violence than in the 50s. And other measures of stigma have stayed absolutely flat even as the knowledge has increased. Maybe we should do what has worked in medicine and simply say, remember the part of the talk about genes, mental illness is caused by deviant genes, aberrant genes. It's in your DNA. It's a disease like any other. And the NIMH tried to do this for many years in some public awareness campaigns. And what happens if experimentally you read about someone with mental health issues and you're led to believe that it's because of a brain disease in the genes that they have been born with? Well, you don't blame them, makes sense. You also don't want to touch them or get close to them, and you believe that their future is hopeless. So unlike with physical illness, the biogenetic ascription tends to increase stigma. What do we need to do? Tell stories and narratives. Get people's empathy involved. Change the media portrayals. Make it illegal. They're still in half the states in our country and I use these words advisedly, if you're crazy enough to admit you have a mental illness, you won't get your driver's license renewed, you can't serve on a jury, you can't vote, and you lose custody of your kids automatically. So if you're smart, you don't say a word about it, which promotes the silence and shame. Why would ADHD be stigmatized? I mean, it's not as severe as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but that's the point. What used to be called Asperger's, now high-functioning autism, is much more stigmatized in schools and families than severe autism. Because you look like you have your stuff together. 
but you're acting weird. Many people with ADHD are smart, with it, creative people, and all those nasty emails to the boss when it didn't go well, probably not such a good idea. <laughs> Blowing out the birthday candles, not your party. It's the impulsivity and erraticism that really fuels the stigma. So stigma doesn't always go with severity. So we'd have a lot more to say about all of this, but it's time for questions, and I think there might be a microphone up there somewhere. Otherwise, just shout it out, and I'll try to repeat. Oh, God, one at a time. Right here. I suspect that uh, some parents uh, take their child out of school and homeschool when their child is ADHD. Right. Is that being tracked as uh, showing any differences in the outcome? So does homeschooling work? A, we don't have any data because there's no data on homeschooling outcomes. B, it might work for some kids, but C, what about the kids' peer relationships? That's the thing I worry about with homeschooling. Now you could do after school activities and it, homeschooling is not one uniform thing, but the sad fact is we simply don't know if this is a good thing, a neutral thing, or a bad thing, and my guess is it's all of the above for different kids. So we're gonna go quick with others right here. And actually, can we have everyone come over to the microphone that way we can Hear everybody, get it on the recording. This is your aerobic exercise <laughs> part of the night. And Walk over to the microphone. I have a woman that has been waiting patiently to answer, so I'm going to let her go first, and then we'll just form a line behind her. Thank you. Hi there. Um, could you specifically tell the difference between a diagnosis of ADHD and bipolar disorder? I've asked this question before, and I've never walked away with an answer I actually understood. So, so I, this so I is, want it more like, well, if you do this, you have bipolar disorder. Or, I don't even know how to ask the question anymore. Right. No, it's a good question. So what's the difference? So it was thought for a long time that you cannot have bipolar illness until you're 16 or 18 or 20. Then 20 years ago in Boston, a group said, no, there's actually a lot of bipolar illness in young kids. 20 years before that, people thought kids couldn't get depressed. Well, it turns out they can. So maybe it's true for bipolar. The people who invented that theory changed the symptoms for bipolar so that it wasn't an episodic illness. So it's not clear if that was, there's really a lot of kids or hardly any. The research that's been done subsequently has shown a few things. First, some of the symptoms are pretty similar. Impulsivity is a symptom of ADHD. Impulsivity is a symptom of mania. Especially in a kid who might not be as verbal as an adult, how do you tell it apart? The things that on average, and remember everything's an average, it doesn't pertain to any particular kid or family, but if you're eight years old and you've got a lot of impulsivity and you're not very attentive, and you're also preoccupied with sexu sexuality, two things, history of sexual abuse or bipolar. Most kids with ADHD don't do that. And the second is, how grandiose are you? Now this is hard for a four-year-old, because every four-year-old's a superhero, <laughs> but what if you're eight or 10? Most kids with ADHD hang on to superhero stuff, but they're not convinced they're smarter than their damn teachers. And they're not convinced they're on the top of the world. That tends to go more with bipolar disorder. So those are the two symptom classes that seem to distinguish most, but often you don't know until the teenage years when that early ADHD may transmogrify into a cyclic mood disorder. We're gonna go to the next. I gotta go quick on these. A question about nar uh, narcissism. Is there any relationship between that and this, uh, all the things that you've been discussing this evening? So narcissism, I'm entitled, I'm smarter than anybody. Is that a defense because I really feel pretty fragile? Is that a symptom of not being too self-reflective of ADHD? So the answer is it's complicated. People with ADHD on average will s score a little bit higher on narcissism scales but it may be because of a quick response style and a not taking in of input. It's not clear that most people with ADHD have true narcissistic personality disorder. So it's one of those interesting, tough ones. Of course, people with ADHD score higher on neuroticism and extroversion and most other traits too. So let's go to the next. I didn't give a very effective answer because we don't know enough. Uh, yes, in a typical, um, let's see, um, say junior high school class, say of what, 20, 20 or 30 kids, how many would you say? Or 30 are, or 40 in some schools. Okay, that's right. fine. That's fine, 30 or 40. How many would you say are being medicated? So the latest national survey of children's health suggests that for all kids 4 to 17, 
so most four and four, five-year-olds aren't getting medicated. It's going to be in grade school and middle school. Of course, most kids in high school with ADHD stop taking the meds because they hate them. They're far from getting addicted to them. They think that the meds make them different and weird and not creative. So under the 2012 National Survey for Health, Children's Health Data, remember it said 11.0% had ever been diagnosed. It's 8.8 .8 of kids have a current diagnosis. And then 70% of them are getting medication. So 70% of 8.8% is about 6% of kids in grade school and middle school in the United States are getting ADHD medication. They may only get it for one prescription. They may not get it long, but that's about the right statistic. Thank you. About 6%. It's pretty sad. Uh, you talked about, I think, the NIH study on um, neurofeedback effectiveness, and mm -hmm. I, w I wonder, I mean, why is the Nas National Association of Pediatricians saying that it has an e equal effectiveness to uh, stimulants? I mean, we see miracles every day with kids getting better, and yet there's no credibility somehow. What, what do we need in terms of so, convincing you? So for many years, there was circumstantial evidence and uncontrolled trials. There's now been some controlled trials showing that you can get better attentional focus with neurofeedback than placebo or the no treatment. But until this new study, no one has ever done a controlled sham neurofeedback. So that's the first point. The second point is nobody gets off the hook. How long do the effects of medication last? As long as the last day you take them. How long do the effects of a reward program last? As long as you are still giving the rewards. Does neurofeedback generalize to homework and soccer? Not nearly as much as its proponents tout. Cogmed, the Klingberg, the Norwegians, specific cognitive training is the solution for ADHD. Nobody can replicate their findings. It doesn't work outside the office. We have not found a treatment for ADHD yet that delivers at home and in school and on the soccer field. So I'm a hard nose with this. We, it's a low-tech diagnosis, and it's low-tech treatments until we make some much more fundamental discoveries. So that's my pointed answer. I have uh, two questions. One is, um, are certain meds more effective for ADD versus ADHD? Yeah. And two, um, what's your opinion on having either an MRI or some scan done of the brain right. to determine the effectiveness yeah. of certain meds? So ADD, sort of the old name for attention deficit disorder without hyperactivity, now would be called the inattentive form. Well, the kids aren't very hyperactive and impulsive, but stimulants work just about as well with them as they do with the combined form, except that the dosage often has to be much lower. The same dosage for an inattentive kid as for the average combined impulsive kid would wig the kid out. There's some evidence that the non-stimulants, the noradrenergic meds, might be preferential for some kids with ADD only, but there's no conclusion on that yet. Now, what about brain scans? What about cognitive tests? What about blood work? This is the problem with mental health. We don't have objective indicators yet. The research is now showing, study by study, 20 people in an fMRI scanner versus 20 controls, 30 versus 30. There are brain differences. But there are many people with ADHD who don't show those differences, and there's many control people who look like they've got ADHD brains, but they don't have the symptoms. We're nowhere near the specificity yet to make individual case determination. It's going to take another 50 years of research. Have there been any studies on the effectiveness of meditation, not medication, but meditation, meditation. The C with versus either T is important with, with either children or adults. So Sue Smalley at UCLA did one of the first studies in 2007, not very well controlled, but suggested some benefits for teens and adults with ADHD. Of course, the question is, what is meditation? What is mindfulness? What, there's many forms of meditation, et cetera, et cetera. There are now a couple of groups around the country that are trying to get enough funding and enough subjects enrolled to do some trials of meditation versus not. I think it's one of these promising treatments that I would be shocked if it alone would generalize to the rest of the person's life. But especially as you get older, it may be a way to be focused and mindful, uh, and it might be a nice supplemental treatment to some of the evidence-based ones. So the answer is we're just doing the research.
Hi. Um, my sister has a grandchild um, who's in sixth grade and was a straight A student and had lots of friends and wasn't uh, listening properly at home. He's now on stimulants. Um, he lives in Tennessee. I wonder how much religion plays into all of this. There's a growing body of research on spirituality and religion as protective factors for many subgroups. It's a resilience promoter, not for everybody. The South has higher rates of these medicines and diagnoses. Is it correlated with religion? We didn't do county by county counts of church attendance. It might be something to look at. It's fascinating. Well, I sort of wonder if it has to do with the doctors who are religious. Could be. I mean, when you find this dramatic area variation state by state, something's going on. A school accountability may be part of it. I'm sure there's many more factors. I definitely think there is. Yeah. You know? All right. We better go on. We got it. There's a line behind you. Thanks. Um, I was wondering if there's a difference um, b the way um, ADHD is expressed in boys and girls because I remember reading yeah. that girls often get diagnosed much later because their symptoms aren't recognized as being ADHD. Right. So this is a big point of controversy. Maybe, so in childhood, there's really about two and a half times more ADHD in boys and girls. There's about five times more autism in boys and girls. There's about six times more aggressive conduct disorder four times more Tourette's. The first 10 years of life are tough for guys. <laughs> the second 10 years of life are tough for girls with depression and anxiety and cutting and eating problems. Why are the first 10 years so tough for guys? Because for the last seven months in utero, if you've got a Y chromosome, it sends a little signal to poison your brain with something called testosterone, <laughs> which slows down your brain development. Don't quote me on this. This is sort of the <laughs> neurophysiology light. Boys' brains aren't as advanced when they're born. You want to see differences between the sexes? Go to a preschool and look at the three-year-olds. The girls are talking in fully formed paragraphs, <laughs> beautiful social interactions, and an occasional male runs through their play activity grunting a few syllables, <laughs> and they wonder what species that kid belongs to. Boys are at risk neurodevelopmentally for any condition because they're not as compliant and verbal and empathic as girls at an early age. So what about if you've got ADHD? You meet the criteria. You're up above, you know, way high on those scales. Girls are more likely than boys to have the purely inattentive form. Most girls with ADHD don't have the inattentive form. They've got the combined form. But maybe 30% of girls and only 15% of boys have the purely inattentive form. That's number one. And number two, there's still a lot of clinicians out there who say if it's a girl, it's got to be anxiety, it's got to be depression, it's got to be a conduct problem because ADHD doesn't exist in girls. That's starting to change. So then the third point is there's twice as much, two and a half times as much depression in women and men than men. Shouldn't we change the criteria? Aggression and alcoholism are pretty prevalent in men. And if we called them depression, then the rates would be equal. But once you start to call everything everything else, it gets really murky. So some people say, change the symptoms for girls so that just being verbal, not being active is part. I think you can go too far. I think there are real sex differences, but I think girls are still underdetected a lot. Who's next? Thank you. And is there a relationship between being raised in a broken home and the acquisition of either ADD or ADHD? So this is a long, contentious literature. If you're raised in a home in which there's divorce, does that predict bad outcomes, including ADHD? Well, yes, but there's actually worse outcomes in many domains for living in a home that isn't broken, but there's a lot of negative parenting. Sometimes a divorce is the best thing you can do. It all depends. ADHD is linked to being in a broken home, but is that because the parents had ADHD themselves? 
Is it because of genetic transmission? Is it because of the deviant communication? And we obviously can't randomly assign kids at risk for ADHD to live in a stable home or a broken home. So yes, but it's part of a correlated mass of biological and psychosocial processes. One more, two more, five more, 10 more. <laughs> Can anxiety cause ADHD or vice versa can ADHD cause? So what about ADHD and anxiety? Amazingly, in most big studies done, 25 to 35 percent of kids with ADHD meet criteria for a pretty significant anxiety disorder. And you think, wait a minute. You only wish kids with ADHD were more anxious. They seem to be the opposite of anxious. They do anything at any time without con seeming consequence. But in the MTA study, in our girl study, and most of the other big studies, there's this surprising comorbidity. You can find a kid, I remember one of the kids I worked with years ago down in Los Angeles, one of the most hyperactive and aggressive kids I've ever seen, who was the most phobic child I'd ever seen too. Are there overlapping genes? Does anxiety Manifest, else, manifest itself as ADHD in some cases. It can, but usually not. The biggest differential diagnosis is for this inattentive type, the ADD without hyperactivity. Sometimes these are kids who are kind of sad and shy and anxious. This is the only time where a medicine trial actually helps you. If you're a kid with ADHD and you have a comorbid anxiety disorder, your ADHD symptoms improve and your anxiety improves on the medicine. If you're a kid with a pure separation anxiety disorder or pure over-anxious disorder without any ADHD and you give that kid a stimulant, they get worse in about a day. So pure anxiety doesn't usually manifest as ADHD. You might be inattentive, but for different reasons. Okay? Thank you for the great review, Dr. Hinshaw. I have a question about um, exercise and mm. Um, given that most school kids don't exercise much during the day, yep. and your comment about compulsory education, I often comment to my families, I wish they could go to school in West Marin on a farm. And there's not much data about exercise other than... There is now. There is? Okay. In the well, last year and a half, three pretty major research groups have randomly assigned kids with ADHD to 30 minutes a day of aerobic exercise for a period of months versus 30 minutes of, oh, you go to a club or you do something indoors but not exercise. The effects are not as big as medication. The effects are not as big as a behavioral program. But the effects are real. Every study now done in the animal and human literature, if you're the age of many people in this room and above, exercise improves your brain function. Does it head off dementia? No, but it might build a reserve along with a lot of cognitive exercises you do. So I think we're going to find sooner rather than later in a holistic treatment program, aerobic exercise should be part of the prescription for many kids with ADHD. But, and how about in the schools? I mean, in the schools, well, these are school-based treatments that are being done. The kids go a half hour early, stay a half hour late for aerobic exercise. Schools can adopt this. Dr. Hinshaw, do we have time for one more question? Sure. All right. If we're just on the break before our 845 <laughs> session, we're doing fine. Thank you. Uh, I have a twin-year-old, uh, well, seven-year-old twin, identical twin boys. One's been diagnosed with ADD, the other one is normal. How do you help us manage the dynamics between them two when one is ADD and the other one is normal? This is a big issue, whether they're twins or triplets, or whether they're any two siblings at different ages. Why does she get the special rewards? Don't you notice me? I do work and nobody, my, she gets all the attention. He gets all of the, you gotta talk to the kids about this. And you have to, in kid appropriate language, they're seven, you say, might be different at nine and 11, what ADHD is. And why some people are strong in one thing and not another, and why some kids need more specific rewards than others. If you don't, everybody will know it and they'll resent it. So there are starting to be some family and even kid books about ADHD that talk about these sibling issues. And you can go online to Chad and some of the other ADHD warehouses. The, the main point is it's like a stigma issue. 
If you keep it in the dark and keep it secret, it's going to fester. Talk about it and remember to spend quality time with the other kids who are doing fine too, so they don't resent it. Thank you. Sure. Okay. There's thank more. You, Dr. There's more. Are, there, are, there, are, there, are those just the people getting a second glass of wine? That's what I really want to know. <laughs> uh, I throw a question at you. Uh, is there a does ADHD um, have anything? Uh, does it come out worse at like different times a day or, or other stuff like that? Yeah. And how's that affect it biologically? Cool stuff? study done 30 years ago by Judy Rappaport back at NIH. They had the first time the wristwatches with the activity monitors in them. It's like, that's an objective measurement, not just somebody's ratings. The people with ADHD moved more 24-7, including during sleep. But when did they move the most more, if that's the right way to say it? <laughs> during school or when somebody else was calling the shots? ADHD isn't inattention, it's dysregulated attention. Maybe if you are competent and you can exert some leadership and you've got a skill, you look good. And then you've got to go to the least favorite subject like algebra and you fidget and squirm and the anxiety builds. And so kids with ADHD and teens and adults go through pockets during a day. There's the good hours and there's the bad hours. If the boss is close by, when there's an argument at home with your primary relationship, those are usually not good moments for people with ADHD because you've really got to be considerate of others and consider their opinion and weigh out and keep in working memory. Why do people with ADHD interrupt so much during some conversations? Are they rude? Maybe they've got a poor working memory, and unless they answer, ask the question quick, they won't remember what you just said. So, yes, ADHD shows itself a lot during the day, but when someone else is directing the activities and when self-regulation is at a premium, that's when you see the symptom. Okay? Hi, I'm wondering if you could comment on the uh, <clears throat> research relationship between sensory processing disorder and ADHD or sensory integration disorder. So this is a big point of controversy. Is there such a thing as sensory processing disorder? Yes, but it's not as well defined as ADHD. Some kids will rip out the tags from the back of, and they're really oversensitive. Other kids seem like they have a sensory undersensitivity, and they're sort of seeking sensation all the time. These don't map very well onto learning disabilities and ADHD and depression and anxiety because the professionals are talking different languages. They're in different camps. Some professions. OT is more into these, psychology less so. Remember, these aren't separate categories. If we can integrate the symptoms and talk about these multidisciplinary perspectives, there's going to be some kids with ADHD and probably even a higher percentage of kids with autism spectrum disorders who will do better if some of the sensory overload is taken away. But the science hasn't caught up with what you're talking about yet. Okay? I actually. Is this working? I actually have a similar processing disorder question. Um, the rise in auditory processing and other yeah. disorders, language processing, et cetera. What's your, what's your professional opinion on the correlation or the overlap with the, that, those disorders? So a lot of kids have what's called inattentive type ADHD, ADD without hyperactivity. Do they really not pay attention well or do they not process auditory information well or visual information? Is there some central auditory or visual or both processing disorder? It's not well enough defined and it doesn't map onto the symptoms more traditionally psychiatrically well enough yet. And there's professional lines that are drawn. I think there's undoubtedly with the right testing a subset of kids with ADHD who really could benefit from more focused educational interventions to get their kind of sensory act together, but again, the science is about 20 years behind the arguments right now. Okay? Is that it? Oh, thank you. One more, one more, one wait more. a minute. One more. Thank you, that was great. So uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the prevalence of sleep loss yeah. over the last 40 years and how that has a powerful regulator of attention and arousal yeah. and how that 
might be an important factor here. So sleep loss, especially in the teenage years over the last decades, is a direct contributor to accidents and depression and school failure. It's unclear if it's related to the increase in prevalence of ADHD. I suspect it's not as much because ADHD shows itself most visibly in the childhood years when the adolescent sleep loss that's cultural now becomes more rampant. But kids with ADHD don't sleep as well as other kids. Is it because they're hyperactive and they are up a lot and their motor's churning? Or do they have a diff different sleep architecture? A student and I are writing a meta-analysis now about what's the actual relation between sleep and ADHD. And there's a lot of studies out there and not much coherence. So it's a plausible explanation, but I don't think we're there yet. OK, this time for sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.